Welcome to the final episode of season 11 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and what better way to wrap up this season than with a chat with Peter Scales about the mental side of the game. It's one of the most discussed topics on our Facebook groups, in our consults, in my email, and I'm thrilled to have Peter back on to not only talk about the mental side of tennis, but also to talk about his new book, which is available on Amazon, and we will have a link to in the show notes on ParentingAces.com. Before I bring Peter back on, I want to just remind you, if you haven't already, we'd love for you to become a premium member of Parenting Aces. You can do that by going to ParentingAces.com and just clicking on the join button in the top right. And with that, you get full access to our website and all of our archived articles and podcasts. You get first looks at new content, at discounts on products and services, and just all sorts of other great stuff, including two complimentary consults with me each year. So I hope you'll take advantage of that and join us. Our podcast is coming to a close for season 11. Hard to believe another year is in the books. We will be back with season 12 sometime in mid-January. I'm going to take a little time away, going to visit my son who's living in New Zealand now and really looking forward to spending the holidays with him and his buddies down there. And in the meantime, I hope you all have a great holiday season, whatever holidays you celebrate. And I hope you enjoy this final episode with Peter Scales. Pete Scales, welcome back to the Parenting Aces podcast. What a great way to wind up our season 11. I'm just so happy to see your face and get to chat with you again. Yeah, same here, Lisa. Uh, Glad to be back and uh, look forward to, to our talk. I think we have a pretty timely topic at hand today, and as we were talking offline, uh, I was sharing with you that the topic of the mental side of tennis is kind of a hot topic right now, at least in the Parenting Aces community and with the parents that I'm speaking with in our consults. It comes up 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So... I would love for you to really dig in over these next few minutes Um, on the mental side, what the parent's role is in helping their kids who are on this elite pathway, this intense pathway for junior development in tennis or any sport really, or any activity, Mm -hmm. um, develop the mental skills that they need to be successful in their sport, in their pursuit, or just in life in general? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's really timely. And and obviously, in the last couple of years, we've had people like Naomi Osaka and Marty Fish, and, and plenty of other folks in sports other than tennis, Gracie Gold and figure skating, Michael Phelps and swimming on and on, beginning to talk about the issues that, that they've been having. Uh, and continue to have, and and how you deal with this at a, at a rarefied level of performance, right? Right. Um, and and part of the part of the issue that complicates it when we're talking about our young student athletes is that they're kids, and the work of being a young person is going on at the same time as they might be on an elite pathway. To, to being this you know, superior athlete. So, so part of the work for parents and coaches and the athlete themselves is to understand that they are more than their tennis. They right. are more than their sport. Their identities are more than it. And it, it's very hard when you're chasing scholarships and colleges may be chasing you uh, and you're getting this kind of really super positive feedback And seeing all these possibilities out there, especially in the world of name, image, and likeness in college now, there's real money out there. There's real money, even if you don't make it as a pro, there's real money in college. So the stakes have have changed. And the pandemic has obviously added a whole lot of stuff into everybody's life and, and figuring that out. 
Um, and we can get into some of that, but, but part of the solution here is remembering their identities are not just the sport they play. Right. And yeah. add to that social media, right? And the pressures oh, yeah. that social media presents. Um, and I, I just read an, yet another article on name, image, and likeness and, and who is getting the offers of the deals, right? And a lot yeah. of it's based on being a, a quote influencer on social media, having followers and how do you get followers? Well, you know, you have to yeah. put content out there. What type of content drives people to click and follow you? Mm -hmm. Not always the type of content that parents are super comfortable with their kids posting. Exactly. Exactly. So much of it is, is about looks, you know, and particularly and sexuality, female, sexuality, particularly for female athletes. Yes. Yeah you know, and it, it, it's that vicious circle and, and some athletes decide, okay, um, I'm empowered and I'm going to decide how far I want to take this. And that's great for them. But as an overall global influence on young people, uh, it's, it's not healthy. Yeah. It's just not, it's just not healthy. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's funny as, you know, somebody in my age, I'm, I won't divulge, um, <laughs> but you know, I have I'm older than you. <laughs> well, yeah, um, I, I have to check myself oftentimes when I'm looking at social media posts by these young people who are trying to garner follows for reasons such as making themselves marketable for name, image, likeness, um, endorsements, money opportunities. And I have to remember that, you know, things are different now. And we as parents can't always look at the current state of affairs with the eyes that we were raised looking at these types of things, right? We have to adjust our perceptions. That said, I'm really interested to hear your take on what's healthy and what's not healthy in terms of the overall mental state and development and health of these athletes as they're going through this process. Yeah, and and you know, part of it is you've got to understand what your purpose is in your sport. Why why do you play? Mm -hmm. What is it that you love about playing? And the challenge is that almost everybody who gets really good at any sport fell in love with that sport. They fell in love with it at not because of winning, not because of name, image, and likeness. We didn't even have that. <laughs> right. They fell in love with it for the running around, the social, the, the, the competition, the challenge of, of, you know, learning how far you can take yourself and solving problems, you know, during a competition. So we need to keep reminding in coaching and not just reminding, but, you know, I've got a new book coming out, the Compete, Learn, Honor Playbook. It's out. Uh, and it's about how, how you actually remind yourself systematically doing exercises on the mental side of the game about why you play, mm -hmm. your reasons. Why does Peter play? Why does Lisa play? You know, and if you're playing for your parents, oops, warning signs. If you're playing for the scholarship, oops, warning signs. These are byproducts. If you end up pleasing people, okay, that's fine. That's a byproduct. If you end up getting a scholarship, that's great. That's a byproduct though. That can't be your primary goal because then what's going to happen, and Jim Lair has talked a lot about this in his books. Mm -hmm. What happens then is even if you reach that goal, if that's your goal and it isn't tied into and connected to some deeper almost spiritual purpose within you, your purpose for being a student athlete, then you're going to be unfulfilled even when you reach that goal. Mm -hmm. You get the scholarship, you get your name in papers on, on TV, whatever, online. And then what? Who are you? Yeah. You know, I, I always say Cornet's coach. I don't know if you, you saw this, but she did a piece um, a couple of years ago and said this is what she told Ali Zay. You are not a tennis player. You are a person who happens to play tennis. Yeah. And I always said that really helped her, right. you know, free up. And, and Iga, you know, 
Triantec is getting similar advice from her psychological coach uh, about the breadth of your identity. Yes, this is an important piece of your identity. Yeah. But you own this. Your parents don't own it. Your coach doesn't own it. The contractor, the recruiter doesn't own it. You are the boss of your tennis career. And even at a young age, you have to be really, really aware of why you're doing this. And those reasons better be for you. Right. And, and that's such an important point. And I, I've talked about this before, but it's a question that I often ask when I interview junior players at big tournaments. You know, what, why did you start playing the game? What do you love about tennis? And most times I get a big thank you from the player for causing them to kind of take a step back and reflect on that and remember what it is that drove them to want to work this hard, to mm -hmm. want to get on this pathway, to want to devote so much of their energy and their time and their life to pursuing excellence in this particular sport, right? Yeah, and yeah. and I think it is important. And I, and I try to remind parents too, that you need to ask your kid that question. You need to check in with them periodically, whether that's monthly, whether it's a couple of times a year, whatever is appropriate in your family setting. But it's really important that we remind our kids to reflect on why they're doing this. What mm -hmm. is it that first made them want to pursue this? That's right. That's right. And it, part, part of what we do um, when we're coaching uh, and when we're being parents is we're giving permission to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. that, that's what good, good coaches and, and good sport parents, tennis parents and others, um, understand that making mistakes is part of the growth process. And, and unfortunately, we, we can get the pressure to perform at such a level that the, the student athletes don't even feel safe to make a mistake, yeah. which ironically, of course, then prevents them from you know, having their vision and their dream reached of being a more competent player. Right. So that's going to inter if you're not making mistakes, you can't grow. Right. Um, so all of this. What, what's the saying? You either win or you learn. Yeah. Well, and hopefully, and I amend that by saying you learn all the time, and sometimes you win. Yeah. You have you have <laughs> to learn from your wins too. If you're not learning from your True. wins, you're you're missing a, a huge part of it. In fact, the better you get, right? Yeah. You, you have to strengthen your strengths the higher up you move. And less time on, on your weaknesses and more time on how am I using my strengths in this situation with this opponent. Um, but, but it's all still within the context of the best in the world make mistakes. And because they're trying different things, tiny, tiny little fixes that they don't have right now. So they're going to make mistakes. And you've got to make mistakes in matches. Yeah. Making mistakes in practice, you don't own it. <laughs> Until you do it when it, quote, counts, um, then you don't own it. So, so, so much of this is about, I love you whether you win or lose. I will love you whether you make mistakes or not, as coach and as parent. Mm -hmm. And I literally tell some of my players, you know, I love you whether you win or lose this match, right? And, and it helps to remind them that, yeah, okay, it's not, you know, this is not the most important thing in my life. It is important right now, but I'm more than this. And right. I can make mistakes. I can lose. You are not a better person. You are not a better human being when you win. You are not a worse human being when you lose. So what I try and, and, and help people do, what my book does, is get to neutral. I'm not saying you have to be positive about losing. Mm -hmm. um, but get to neutral. Think of it as, what did I learn today? There's, there's two things, there's two exercises out of the dozens in this new book. What am I working on today? And after my practice and my match, what did I learn today? And if you don't do anything but those two, and why do I love playing tennis? Those mm -hmm. three. Um, then you'll become a better player because mentally you will start focusing more on 
This is all about solving problems. Yeah. That's all it is. It's not about your worth as a human being. Right. It's about solving problems. Sometimes you solve them and sometimes your opponent solves them to a higher degree that day. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Right. Yeah. And it's it's that whole thing of every time you step foot on the court, whether it's practice or tournament play, trying to get 1% better, right? Aiming for that that incremental improvement. And you're not always going to have it. Not every day is going to see your forehand get better or your movement get better. But maybe that day sees your mindset improve that 1%. Maybe you're able to get back to neutral, as you said, after losing a, a point, you know, on an unforced error, let's say. Yeah. And that's your 1% that day is that I got back to neutral on that one point. Maybe you didn't do it again the whole time you were on the court. But if you did it once, that's that's a step forward. It's a step in the right direction. I'll, I'll give you two two examples. Um a lot of players play fine early in the match, mm -hmm. right? Late in the match, third set, five all, okay? You still go for your big forehand? Do you go for it or do you get careful? So if I have a player who goes for it and they lose, mazel tov. Yeah. You went for it. That's what we wanted. Mentally, there's your 1%. There's your step in the right direction that you're talking about, even if they lost. Yeah. They, they made that huge. They played the right commitment. way. They committed at, at the moment of, of real pressure, not mm -hmm. at 0-0 zero, zero starting the match, right? Yeah. Anybody can play okay in the first few games, but late in the match. Another one I'll give you, I worked with a college player, number one on their team, and they would hit themselves on the leg with their racket when they lost a point and sometimes even when they won a point but didn't win it the way they wanted <laughs> they were really hard on themselves and our agreement after a week of having them keep track of how they responded after every single point bodily mentally what was going on they could see the patterns and so i didn't have to tell them they i had them keep track of it they could tell themselves yeah. and we came to one agreement they could do the entire thing of swinging their racket down toward their leg, but they had to miss their leg on purpose. Hmm. And they laughed, right? When I said, that's what I want you to do. That's the contract. Yeah. And it immediately changed. It, it immediately changed their demeanor to the point where their teammates started noticing how calm they were. Wow. They thought that they were winning at times when they were losing because they were so much calmer. And I mean, not completely, but it, it made a huge impact because why? It gave a little bit of control back to the player that I'm the boss of this. You're making a decision when you choose to be cautious instead of commit to your shot when the pressure is on. You're making, a, you're making a decision. You're making a decision when you throw your racket as opposed to, okay, why did I lose that point? Oh, because obviously I didn't put enough topspin on it. That's why it flew 50 feet past the baseline. Yeah. Okay. Problem solving. But it, it, it's all what you said. It's these tiny little things that don't seem like much that are just huge in changing the mindset. Right. You know, one of the, the questions I get a lot is, my kid plays great in practice. They beat everybody in their drill group. And then they get to a tournament and it looks like they've never stepped foot on a tennis court before. What's going on? How do we fix this? Right. Yeah. And I never am a hundred percent sure how to answer that other than by saying that the focus has to be on the development, not the outcome, right? We have to keep that growth mindset and, you know, think about this in terms of a journey and baby steps forward and the 1% incremental improvements and all of these things that you've been saying. But the reality is that for some players, the just the act of knowing that the match counts, yeah. Yeah. they all of a sudden freeze up. They, they cannot perform to the level that, that, they know they're capable of doing 
because yeah. mentally something is blocking them. Yeah. What is your advice to players that find themselves in that situation? And what is your advice to the parents of those players to help them let go of that outcome-based thinking? Well, nobody's going to like the answer. Um, and the answer is uh, don't try and let go of it. <laughs> um, Say that there. one more time, Peter. <laughs> don't try and let go of it. It's there with us. I call it our, our it's our lizard brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. And our lizard brain gets activated when we have a threat to survival, you know, and it's based on ba human need. I mean, we don't, we don't know that we, our lizard brain doesn't know that we just shanked the ball. Mm -hmm. They think a saber tooth tiger is chasing. Us, <laughs> right. And yeah. we got, the lizard just wants to get out of there. So the lizard starts driving your tennis bus just like that. And and so my advice is the, the ineffective thing to do is to try and kick the lizard off the bus. Mm. The lizard is with us. That's part of being a human being. So I'm just trying to, with all this stuff, put the lizard in the passenger seat. Okay. So part of it is just simply acknowledging I'm scared. I'm scared of losing. Why are you scared of losing? Because people are going to think I'm terrible. They're not going to like me anymore. They're going to know I'm a screw up and a fake. I'm not really number one. That guy's number one. <laughs> no, look at him, you know. I, so it's acknowledging that this is there. It's real. Mm. It is real. So how do, we, how do we manage that? Okay. Part of how you manage it, I'm, it may surprise you that I'm going to say that the, the cognitive the mental aspect of it is the third thing I want players to do. The first two things is are, 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 are John Wooden put on your socks correctly kind of things. Yeah. They have to learn how to breathe properly and when, and they have to learn how to relax muscles. Hmm. Because if, because this is the fear manifests itself in, in freezing mentally, right? The brain yeah. But, but it expresses itself in every kind of physical symptom, right? You know that. Yeah. Your, your voice gets, your mouth gets dry, your stomach gets all tight, your palms get sweaty, heartbeat goes, goes fast. So you have to learn how to breathe properly and how to relax muscle groups before you can do the reminding of yourself with good cue words like, okay. Mm. problem solving it's all a puzzle i love being out here great day to play tennis all that stuff is helpful you know mental cue words but they won't work to get the lizard into the passenger seat until you first help players deal with the physicality of it it's a physical emotion mm. it's a mental one so i love that that yeah. is that is that is a new way of thinking about this for me. Um, okay. I, and it's funny because I, I practice yoga and I do a lot of breath work and, you know, I, I used to teach group fitness classes. So I'm, I'm very kind of tuned in to what my body does and how it feels at certain moments, but I've never had anybody say that you have to take care of the physical piece before the mental piece will work. And I think that's a really, really important thing for people to hear because learning how to breathe properly and when to breathe properly, it's not a difficult thing to learn. It just yeah. takes practice. And it's something our bodies do instinctively. We just have to sometimes remind ourselves to do it because that fear puts mm -hmm. the kibosh on letting our bodies function the way they're designed to function, right? So I love that. I love this whole notion of practicing the breathing and maybe, and I did have a coach tell me this years ago that as you're making contact with the ball, you blow out. And mm -hmm. I know, you know, there's a lot of controversy on players making noise on the court and it being right. a distraction <laughs> and is it a tactic and yada, yada. But there is some science-based evidence that exhaling upon contact 
will help you a play better and b remain calmer during your match absolutely and and and, and it then, takes practice it takes practice and and then the the thing that that happens this is that this then becomes part of your between points routine yeah so you know before you start a point and after you end a point you've got your 20 seconds you've got to get the body under control first and that's where at least a neutral reaction comes in the, the problem that a lot of people I, I think have when they approach the mental side of the game is they want to go from defense to offense without mm -hmm. going for neutral mm -hmm. but if you're pulled really wide right uh, even if it's on your forehand side and your forehand's your favorite you're you're pulled wide and off balance are you going to really want to try for an offensive shot from there no the shot is a high deep lob to get you back to neutral right right and i think people try and rush past the neutral so well and and yeah. i would even say peter yeah. that you know i i would love to challenge our listeners tense up your body mm -hmm. tense every muscle in your body and try and take a deep breath yeah and then relax all the muscles in your body and try and take a deep breath yeah feel the difference of that so the two go hand in hand the, yeah, the breathing and the muscle relax re relaxation go hand in hand you can't do they one do. without the other they do and and there's some players who um of course a lot of players resist this as well that's just so basic yeah Yes, yes, it is, and it will change your game. Right. If you, get, if you get really good at breathing the way an athlete's supposed to breathe. But then with some players, the, the door to open this to help them go through it is technique. Mm. And, and I'll just use the tensing muscles example that you just did, uh, because almost everybody wants to hit the ball harder, right? Yeah. Is swinging faster. That's where the pace comes from, speed. You can't swing the racket fast if you're muscular. So I have them get all tense and then try and do a forehand or a serve as fast as they can. And now go through a little muscle relaxation, take the pinky off the grip and feel your arm like cooked pasta. Mm -hmm. And now notice the difference. And, and just as you said, the breathing, you can either go from breathing, start with breathing or start with muscle relaxation, but, but the other is going to happen. Yeah. They're correlated, as you said. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you show them how to relax and it, it makes a difference in the speed. So they've got their goal. They, they see how they can hit the ball, quote, harder by being more relaxed right. and more in control of their breathing. I had a yoga instructor say to me years ago that a tight muscle is a weak muscle. Yeah, that's so great. it's exactly that. what you're saying, right? You, yeah, in order that. to generate the racket head speed, you can't be tense. In yeah. order to move quicker, you can't be tense. Everything has to be relaxed and allowed to move through its full range of motion to generate the power, to generate the speed that you're seeking in order to find success. And sometimes after you've done the breathing the relaxation, um, I, I've got another thing I do where, I, I mean, you do lie to yourself. Some people need <laughs> to make it till you make it. <laughs> well, well, that kind of thing. It's like, you know, what's the most common co excuse that I hear? The most common excuse that I hear when people don't play well is I hate the wind. I hate the sun when it, when it's outdoors yeah. you know, or indoors. It's, it's the lights. Yeah. I hate the lights. You know, that's me at night. <laughs> yeah. I hate the light. So you make a list of all the things you hate, your excuses, and then you flip. You, I played judo when I was in high school. So you judo. I say, this is a judo move. Okay. You flip it around and you say, I love playing in the wind. I love playing in the sun. I love it when my opponent's a pusher. I love it. And you don't believe it right away, mm -hmm. but you can just by saying that and smiling, and sm I'm big on, on yeah. telling them to smile too, because that's another way of relaxing. It's hard to be muscularly tense if you're grinning. Yes. And when you, when you hear yourself say, I love to play in the wind. I love to play in the sun. I love it when my opponents 
you know, do bad line crawls. You start to smile and of course you don't love it, but you only have to convince one person and that's you. Right. <laughs> and that will relax you. That's the whole point. It will relax you enough to see what's really going on in the match, because that's the other part of why compete, learn, honor all go together. If you're tense, if you're worried about losing, worried about what people will think of you and your scholarship and all that, then you will have this kind of narrow vision of the court. And mm -hmm. if you're spending too much time on yourself and not enough on watching what your shots are making your opponent do. Yeah. What is the effect that your shots are having on your opponent? That's what you need to be looking at. And you can't look at that objectively if you're all focused on your innards and your image and all of that. I mean, so you're just going to play more poorly, not yeah. only because of muscle tension, but because you're not observing properly when you're focused on the lizard brain being the driver of the bus. I mean, that's just got to get the lizard into the passenger seat. Do you think it is valuable for developing players to write these things down, to record them and play back the recording for themselves or some other method of making sure that they remember what the purpose is and why they're there and, and the appropriate mindset to take out onto the court with them exactly exactly i mean you know you can write it down and then bring it with you to any match and look at it you mm -hmm. can record it for yourself and look at it practice mm -hmm. video and audio yourself um whatever works for you i mean we all have different modalities right for learning yeah but you cannot and, and the best thing is learn it and then teach it to somebody else teach it to a teammate Teach it to your doubles partner, you know, uh, this yeah. mental technique. Um, that'll really reinforce it in yourself. But you're right. You can't just, you can't listen to a podcast and say, okay, I got this. Right. <laughs> That's right. a good first step. <laughs> you got to take notes and then yeah. you've got to read the notes or listen to the notes. Look and then them. you have to internalize it, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's got to become part of your routine, your Right. auto responder if you will you know that well that's you meant just made a really really good point about rehearsing it and i think that's the other thing about the mental game that an awful lot of parents coaches and players still don't understand that they think this should come naturally yeah you know like like the breathing like that should come. they think the mental should come naturally it doesn't. You've got to work just as hard on the mental as you do on the technical. I mean, I ask coaches when I do workshops and there's an exercise in the book, how much of your, you know, how much of tennis is mental? Well, anywhere from 50 to 90 percent, people will say. Mm -hmm. How much of your practice time is spent on the mental game? Uh, um, less than 10 percent. Yeah. <laughs> if you're being honest, you know, <laughs> less than 10. So if, if you even improved your mental uh, allocation to 12 to 15 percent right um you're way ahead of your peers as, as a player and coach and it will make a difference uh, i'm not saying you have to have 90 percent of your practices be about the mental game but the higher up you go the higher up you go tiny tiny uh improvements make big differences because the margins are so yeah. Tight. They're so small, you know, that a very, very tiny improvement in your mindset and just like a tiny improvement technique, there's a point and a point at the right time is a game and a set and a match. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's so interesting if those of you watching or listening, if you have an opportunity at a professional event or even a college event to get there early and watch the practices, the warmups, and see what these high level players are doing prior to stepping foot on the competition court, you'll see that the things they're doing are very basic. There's mm -hmm. no magic bullet that solves all of this. There's not something that Roger Federer knows that nobody else knows. 
you know, there's nothing that Serena Williams knows that nobody else knows. The basics are the same for every single player, regardless of the level at which you're playing. It's just a matter of being religious about practicing and then implementing those basics from start to finish of a match. And, and as Peter just said, you know, the margins at that, the higher you go, the margins get slimmer and slimmer. And the difference maker is who can stick to those basics from start to finish. Well, and, and building on that, Lisa, is it gets harder and harder to improve. Yes, because um, you're already did, so good that there's not so much good. room. Yeah, I just did our season ending awards banquet, right, for our, our tennis team. And we had three very different levels, you know, so I gave out three different levels of most improved player because most improved is very different when you're more of a beginning player and a more advanced player. For sure. And and, and the challenge is. It's easy to improve when you're a beginning player. I'm a beginning pickleball player. So I'm improving like rapidly, Yeah. <laughs> but I'm an advanced tennis player. So it takes a lot more work to get comparable <laughs> improvements yeah. in, in tennis. So you have to have, it, it doesn't get easier when you get better. That's a myth. It gets harder. And so you have to recommit even more, the better you get if you're gonna make significant improvements. Mm -hmm. It's harder and it's slower. So you, again, you have to be more patient, mm -hmm. you know. Another challenge. <laughs> it's another challenge. So that's what champions do. Right. Champions extend their timeline. They, they're more patient with the process. They're more forgiving of their mistakes. And as you said, in practice, they're religiously doing the things in practice that they want to be on instinct mm -hmm. in the match. One of, one of my phrases is think during practice, feel during the match. You know, you want to be on instinct when you're playing. In between points, think, yes. During the point, feel, instinct, all right, always. But you can't do that unless in practice. Uh, and I'll give you an example, your between points ritual. Everybody needs to have a four R between points ritual. And if you don't have it, you're, you're not gonna handle that 20 seconds properly, effectively. But how many times in practice do coaches really re remind players say, hey, 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 you're going too quickly there. Mm -hmm. Run through your ritual, you know? Yeah, There's rarely. Four, four parts to the ritual, run through the ritual. Yeah. 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 So what are those four parts? Well, you've got to have a positive response. Okay. Now, I, I, I say at least a neutral response, okay? A way of relaxing, okay? A way of refocusing, and then a way of being ready as you step up to the line, whether you're returner, server, returning team, serving team and dubs. Um, those four things have to happen in 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. And it starts with, What's your response? You know, okay. I have often found that the simple okay is enough. That doesn't mean you're okay with losing a point or shanking a ball. It means you're okay that that point's over. Mm -hmm. It's history. Okay. <sighs> Relax, muscle tension, the refocus. What did I learn from that that I want to do same or differently on this next point? And then some cue word, you know, like now or ready or go as you step to the line that commits you to nothing in your life matters, but right now, mm -hmm. all that matters in your whole life, your boyfriend doesn't matter, your girlfriend, your parents, <laughs> nothing matters <laughs> now. I and love that. Got to go through that religiously every time. Things. And then it will become instinctive in a match when the pressure's on. Right. Yeah. So, Peter, I want to kind of take this to the next level um, as we wind up our conversation. And that is, you know, we've talked a lot about utilizing these techniques in a tennis match or in a tennis practice for a tennis player who is aspiring to reach a high level in the sport. Why is this important 
when you're not playing tennis? How do we utilize these methods just as human beings functioning in the world to be better at being ourselves? Yeah, well, I mean, that's you just put, the, put your finger on it. And that's why we want to remind players and give them exercises to do that remind them that this is just a part of you. And, you know, what's, what's really important are your values, how you treat other people, um, you know, the purpose that you've given your life to, um, the issues that you, that you care about most deeply, the relationships you have. Um, these are the things that matter. And so how you treat your opponents uh, has a whole lot to do with how you treat other people that you meet. Um, and that you may be competing with uh, in business. You may be competing with, as well as working with on, on community projects. I mean, in, in your family, there's all of these lessons transfer to the rest of your life. And, and so that's why it's really important to understand this isn't just about tennis. And I think that's what, that's what working on the mental game can really help players um, get better at, which is, you know, this is about school and my friendships and my family and my work. And I can apply this anywhere. Right. I can apply the principles of giving my fullest effort, the effort I have that day. Give 100% of the 60, if you're only 60% of yourself, give 100% of that 60%, mm -hmm. right? Be an open and curious and humble learner. No one knows everything. No one knows everything. We're all always learning. Coaches too. Um, and and honor. You know, it all starts with honor. That your opponent is a de assume your opponent is a decent human being. Yeah. And you know, if they're making a bunch of bad line calls, something's going on in them. They're afraid. They're afraid. You know, psychologically. Um, remind yourself of that. They're still their motives are probably more pure than, than they seem. Mm -hmm. They're a person just like you. They're afraid of losing, just like you're afraid of losing. They have a lizard brain too. So how you treat people in tennis, you know, is a pretty, pretty important indicator of how you're gonna treat people elsewhere too. When, when things matter to you, you know, when things matter to you, are you the kind of person you wanna be and the kind of person that other people admire? And also oh, yeah. learning to show yourself grace when things yeah. aren't going the way you yeah. want them to go or hope they'll go, right? And I think that's another piece of this is that self-forgiveness that, mm. you know, I like you said, some days you're 60%. So give yourself grace in that moment. Give 100% of that 60% but be okay with the fact that you're only 60% today. <laughs> and, yeah. you yeah. know, it's, it's okay. It's not world ending. No, no, it's, it's not. And in fact, that, that grace that you give yourself enables you to become better. Right. The irony is that the less you forgive yourself for not performing effectively or for making mistakes, the more that closes off your, your chance of, of learning. So I, I always say, look, you don't have to win. You do have to learn. Yeah. If you come off the court having learned something, the W's and the L's, they'll take care of themselves. And, you know, we're all going to win some. We're going to lose some. Very few people are undefeated their whole career. Yeah. You know, most of us lose at least as much as we win. <laughs> so yeah. and the other thing is, too, Lisa, that even if you're great, Right, we've seen at the pro level a uh, changing of the guard in men's and women's tennis mm -hmm. this last year. Right, maybe maybe Serena is or she, she's flirting with. <laughs> is yeah. she retired? Yeah, we not? don't know what's going on with her. Uh, exactly Roger yet. is retired. Roger's yes. retired. <laughs> Mirka will see to that for sure. <laughs> He's not coming back. But but they they have been the best, and yet their lives in performing tennis, competing tennis are over hmm. so what's what's left what is the so you're always building you know um 
great high school players don't always get to play in college. So your career is, is over in that sense and fewer college make pro. So, I mean, the pipeline gets narrower and narrower, narrower it's like more narrow <laughs> as, as you move on. And it always reminding you, what's the rest of my life? Right. What's the rest of my identity about? And the more you, all the psychological and sports science research is absolutely clear about this. The more you tie your identity to how you perform, the less happy you're going to be the more depressed, the more anxious, and the less likely that your achievements will fulfill you. Mm. Or your identity includes your sport and includes, yeah, it's better to win than lose. All of us, it's more fun, sure. Right. But the more your identity includes all of it, the happier you're gonna be, the more you handle ups and downs, the less depressed, the less anxious, the more you give to others. I, I mean, it's just, absolutely clear you've got to do the work of making sure that this is just one part of your life not yeah. the whole thing yeah i love that i think that's a great place to stop peter i want to make sure that i give yeah. you the opportunity to talk a little bit about your new book and how people can get a copy yeah um it's the compete learn honor playbook i can't see it. it's all blurry Simple, simple steps to take your tennis and pickleball mental and emotional game to a new level. Okay, we're going to just not, I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear the P word. So, yeah, tennis. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, but it's in there. <laughs> but it's tennis. Just tennis. kidding you. Sure just kidding tennis. you. Um, and it's, it's, you can start it anywhere, open the book anywhere, and it's one to two pages on each of the two dozen compete learn honor habits, and then three dozen or more worksheets, activities, exercises, some to do on the court, some to do off the court, uh, that are really easy to do, um, and that will absolutely elevate your mental emotional game, regardless of what level you're at. You can be a beginning player, you can be a tournament player, you can be a scholarship D1 player, and you'll get something out of this book. I love it. And where can people find it? Amazon. The compete, okay. The Compete, Learn, Honor playbook. <laughs> uh, awesome. And we will have a link to the Great. Amazon page in the show notes on parentingaces.com. Um, we're also putting the final touches on our holiday gift guide, and we will yeah. absolutely include the book there because this is a great stocking stuffer for the tennis players in your life, and um, it, it will be a great gift for them. So it is. And I just encourage people get the book. And um, if you like it, please leave a review on Amazon. That's how more people will find out about the book when they awesome. search for, you know, mental game and tennis. Love it. Love <laughs> yeah. it. Love it. Lisa, thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's always such a pleasure to speak with you. And I always learn something new. So what a great way to close out our season um, with this wonderful conversation. And for my listeners, I hope that you learned a little something or a lot of some things today from mm -hmm. Peter Scales and that you will click on the link and purchase his new book via Amazon. And it will again be in the show notes on parentingaces.com. Peter, wishing you and yours a very happy holiday season, whatever holidays y'all celebrate. And same to all my listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we will see you next year for season 12 of the Parenting Aces podcast.